Suggestions only wives can make. Okay, we're in Hebrews again. And I'm excited to finish this. Introduction, not papers. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's open it in prayer and we'll start. Father, thank you for the book of Hebrews. Um, I'm so excited to teach it and I, I think it is so relevant to us and where we are. And uh, Father, I just pray that uh, um, I'd be able to communicate some little part of that and that uh, you'd be honored by what's taught today and ask your blessing on the hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week, I went through great detail <laughs> to tell you that Pop-Tart wrote the book of Hebrews. By Pop-Tart, I mean Paul Orr, a Pauline-trained, appointed, trained and appointed regional teacher. So there were three places where Paul taught for long periods, a year and a half or more. One of them was while he was first imprisoned in Rome. He had rented quarters and he was able to teach for a year and a half. Another one was in Corinth where he taught for a couple of years and then in the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus. So at those times, people who were with him were trained like Silas and others who came along like Apollos. And so um, it's pretty clear that, that the book of Hebrews contains all sorts of revelation that was provide, that had been provided by Paul. It was, it was Pauline doctrine, and we're gonna see it all the way through the book. And so either Paul wrote it, or someone who was trained by him. In this day, we would say um, he was ordained. So it's either Paul or an ordained Pauline teacher, okay? So one of those wrote it. So now the question is, who did they write it to? So in the book, it talks about I, the author, and then you, and the you is plural. So we know it was written to a group of people, not to an individual. Um, get to the next point here. So background. Uh, how do I go backwards? So here are some of the um, regional teachers that Paul appointed. He sent Timothy. Uh, to Ephesus and to several places, actually. He sent him to Corinth, he sent him to Philippi. Uh, Titus, he sent to Crete. Um, Apollos, he sent to Corinth. Tychicus, he sent to Ephesus. Silas was with him. Priscilla and Aquila were in three different places. All three places where Paul taught, they showed up. So um, those are the kinds of people, one, of the, one out of that group, is the one who wrote the book of Hebrews. So who did they write it to? You can see what I wrote on the sheet is, it, the author was either Paul or one of his trained teachers, and if the latter, they were probably trained in Ephesus, Corinth, or Rome, where they were, he had them for a long time. So now, who are the recipients? What I've written on the right, so here's a picture of Paul, that's actually, uh, the picture on the left is a statue. It is in a place called uh, Paul Outside the Wall. Uh, um, uh, uh, Cathedral of Paul Outside the Wall. And, th and according to um, the Romans, or according to the, the Catholic Church, this is where Paul is buried, is underneath that cathedral. So we got to go there and what's hanging over the plate, the little crypt, you just look down into a little crypt area and uh, uh, up above it are supposedly the chains. When he says, I'm in chains in Rome, supposedly his chains are there. I don't know whether they really are or not, who knows? But so that's a picture of Paul. How you know as you go through any of the old sites who the statue is of is what he's carrying. 
Every statue of Paul, he will always be carrying a sword because he's the one who's contending for the faith. He's the one fighting. If it's a statue of Peter, he's always carrying keys, the keys of the kingdom. So all over Italy. So I tried to find, I said, okay, there's a statue of Paul. So yesterday I went on the internet and I tried to find a statue of Apollos. Zip, none. <laughs> so um, the only, and the only artwork I could find was some uh, Renaissance area artwork and it was uh, two guys, one guy planting and another guy watering and it's from the passage that says, Paul says, I planted and Apollos watered. Uh, but they are both, both naked except for a loincloth. And I thought, <laughs> that's probably not appropriate for the message this morning. So, so to whom did he write it? Well, first of all, we're pretty sure that they were Jewish because of all the Old Testament references. The book is just loaded with literally dozens of Old Testament rep references. They're all from the Septuagint, quoted from the Septuagint. So these people are familiar with the Septuagint, which suggests that they, were, they are diaspora Jews. They are Jews who are spread out from from Jerusalem, they're, they're not in Israel. They grew up uh, with the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so they're Jewish, they're Christians. He clearly states that they're brethren and he talks about their belief in Christ and all those things. So they're, they're Jewish, but they're Christians. Uh, he says he mentions Timothy as if they know him. So um, Hebrews, let's go to the end of the book. 13.19, he says, um, is it 19, the verse I want? Uh, and I urge you all the more to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So obviously he has met them and they know him. And later on in verse 23, it says, Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I shall see you. So they know the writer. They know Timothy. And so obviously um, they have that kind of background. Uh, they are in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. It says, You and I both, the readers and he both, have to rely on the firsthand accounts of the people who saw Christ. So these people were not first generation believers. They were not the group of, well, like with the apostles who witnessed Christ. They are, they are have been told about Christ. And so they're what we call a second generation believer. They're, they're the next generation of believers. So in Hebrews chapter six and verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name, having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And so the idea is that they were uh, well enough equipped and well enough off that they could minister to other people. Remember how, how Paul was always collecting uh, collections for the saints who were in, in uh, Jerusalem because they were poor? So, so clearly this group is not in that category. Um, then Hebrews 13, 24, we think they're in Italy because of verse 13, 24. It says, greet all the leaders, uh, greet all your leaders and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. So, so greet those people who are with you and those people who are from you with me, people who are from Italy with me also send greetings to you. Okay, so I take it, and most people take it, that this was a, they were in Italy, maybe in Rome, maybe not in Rome, okay? And they were obviously comfortable with the Septuagint. So what I wrote on the page, in that right column, the recipients are second generation diaspora Jewish Christians, probably from a house church in Italy. Okay, so that's who Paul is, or who the author is writing to. So now my YouTube comment. 
I have a YouTube channel. I, I think I may have mentioned this last week. And I took a little class, and it's, it's how to make YouTube uh, videos. How to, you don't just make a video and just throw it out there. Whoever's interested, look at this. The idea is you take a look at what, who, who are you writing for? Okay, so describe this person. How old are they? What do they like? What content are they interested in? If you, could, if you felt you had something to share with them, what would you share that, that that person would appreciate? What kind of content would they appreciate? And so then you go through this whole exercise to do this, and uh, I filled it all out and I got all done, and then, then it came up the next question. Okay, now give them a name. It's sort of like, you know, Karen has become synonymous with a certain connotation in our world now. Um, used to be when uh, Ellen has a brother named Bob, and you can find all sorts of t-shirts that say Bob. Of course I'm right, I'm Bob, you know, those kinds of things. So the idea is you give this person a name. So the question is, do we know any second generation Jewish Christians in Italy by name. Can we find one that might, might fit? Turn to the book of Romans. The answer is yes. End of the book of Romans. So we're looking for a Jewish Christian who grew up outside of Israel, living in Italy, familiar with Paul and his students, Financially okay, but struggling spiritually in a need of encouragement, possibly a house church. So go to Romans 16. This is the last chapter of Romans. Okay, now background. When Paul wrote Romans, had he been there yet? No. So Paul wrote the book of Romans because he intended to go there and intended to teach there. His goal, because Rome was the center of the then known world. This is the place where, where um, we, we need to uh, create disciples. I'm working, he worked his way across in the missionary trips. He didn't know at the time that he was gonna get delivered there in a prison ship, but he had a goal of going to Rome. But you can tell from the book of Romans that even before he went, he knew a whole ton of people in Rome. In his, in his travels, he had met all sorts of people and heard about all sorts of people. And in chapter 16, he gives a whole list. Greet this person and this person and this person and this person, some of whom he had met and knew were in Rome now, some of which he had just been told about, okay? So six, chapter 16, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord. So she's someone he's met and gonna be traveling to Rome. Receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. You help her in whatever manner she have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who they, they traveled around and they made tents wherever they went. And uh, so they're now apparently in Rome, who for my life risked their own necks to whom not only do I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Greet the church that's in their house. Greet Epinetus, my beloved, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who's worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsman. By my kinsman, he means a fellow Jew, okay? So here's two of them. There's two Jews who are in Rome, and they were fellow prisoners, and they're outstanding among the apostles, mean, meaning they're known by the apostles, and also were in Christ before me. They were Christians before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus. Anyway, it goes down and down and down. Now go to verse 11. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who, Narcissus, who are in the Lord. So here's Herodian. So we got three names here. We have Herodian, Andronicus, and Junius. So Andronicus and Junius have been believers for a long time. They may have 
been believers from, from Israel or not. But apparently, uh, verse 11, Herodian is not. So I'm going to say Hebrews is written to Herodian or somebody like him, okay? And those who, who are in the church where he goes. Okay, so here we got this teacher who's trained by Paul or Paul himself writing to Herodian and his friends. Okay, so when did they write the book? Okay, so here's what we've got on our sheet. Uh, Pop-Tart wrote it to Herodian and probably the Jewish house church, his Jewish house church friends. Okay, so here's the events around the time of this book. Paul's letter to Romans is generally dated at 58 AD. The fall of Jerusalem is in 70 AD. And since this book talks about the sacrifices still being offered, and they weren't offered after 70 AD, we know it's probably written before 70. So it's written after Paul contacted the Romans and before 70. So somewhere between 58 and 70. So Paul was in prison in 60 to 62. We don't know what happened between 62 and 4, but he was imprisoned again from 64 to 68, or maybe continuously. Peter was martyred around 64 AD, generally thought to be in Rome. Paul was martyred somewhere between 64 and 68, probably in 68. The Jewish-Roman War was from 66 to 73. So, so the Romans started fighting against the Jews in 66. They finally took Jerusalem in 70, and then it took them a couple more years before they took Masada, which was the final straw in 73, okay? So if you put all that together, it's generally thought that this book happens between 64 and 68. Paul has been taken prisoner, Likely Peter has just been killed and Paul is on the docket to be killed, okay? So now imagine all that's happening in Rome and you're the author of this book and you're, if you're sitting in Rome, you're thinking, this is not good. So now let's talk about the political events. Jeremy t- likes to talk about the one and the many. Hey, well, welcome Jeremy. Uh, The Roman Empire had an issue with the one and the many. So before it was an empire, it was ruled by the Senate, the many. The problem is the Senate is like modern day House of Representatives and Senates. (laughs) They can't agree on anything. (laughs) That's why we have interim funding and all sorts of other kinds of things going on. And they spent all their time arguing with each other and didn't get very much done. So leaders would arise and they would want to get things done. And particularly, Rome was built on generals. Remember the, uh, uh, what was the, the movie, uh, White Christmas? What do you do with a general when he's done generaling, was the song. Well, what do you do with a general when he's done generaling in Rome? He wants to come back and be emperor, right? So he goes and conquers things and comes back and gets an entourage and, and so there's this fighting back and forth between the Senate and um, is, it, is Rome ruled by a Senate, many, or is it ruled by one? So Julius Caesar was the first Caesar and he got assassinated because he was, they didn't like the idea of one. And so they went back and forth for a little while. They had a triumvirate of three leaders and then it came back to Augustus. And from Augustus on, there was one ruler. Now, Augustus was a reasonably good ruler. You can see 27 BC to 14 AD. Then came a group of really rotten rulers. So there's a generally accepted that there were six particularly cruel rulers in Rome. And following Augustus, three of the six, the next four leaders included three of the six worst. So, There's a problem with the many, there's a problem with the one. When you got one and he's a rotten leader, 
So the first one was Tiberius from 14 to 37, then Caligula, particularly bloody. Claudius was not a bad ruler in that he reinstated the rule of law and did reasonably good things, but he had absolutely rotten choice in women. And uh, um, he married a gal who made him disown his own son and install her son, who was Nero. So Nero became ruler in 54 to 68. And under Nero, uh, Rome burned in 64. He blamed the Christians. And uh, he, under his rule, both Peter and Paul were martyred, partly as uh, blamed for the fact that Rome was uh, burned down. So what had happened was Rome had increased, um, um, when Augustus was there, they, they said that uh, something to the effect of Augustus found a city, uh, a city of wood and brick and he left it a city of marble. Not quite true, but after Augustus, what happened is Rome grew rapidly and it was all wood and flammable materials. And one time a fire started somewhere near the Hippodrome and spread, took out much of Rome. So that happened during the reign of Nero. Uh, the story is sometimes that Nero started it, but probably not. Uh, but he, he blamed the Christians for starting the fire. So Christians were in ill repute at this time. They were suspect. So after Nero, from 68 to 69, they had three rulers. They lasted seven months, four months, and six months. So this was not a period of time of stability. It was not a period of time of the rule of law. It was not a period of time where you could trust your government. Amazing how that would be. Can you imagine a time like that? Um, so most people believe that, bottom line, Hebrews was written between 64 and 68, after the fire and while Nero was still the ruler, okay? So, um, the Jews had been kicked out of Rome multiple times, I believe three times this time, going back to some time in BC. So, so there have been periods of time where Romans would get all upset with the Jews and they would kick them out and then they'd say, and the, the anger would pass and they would be let, allowed back in and then they'd get kicked out and allowed back in. And there's a couple of references in the New Testament to times when uh, people left under one of those. I believe that's why Aquila and Priscilla left the first time. So, so here's what happened between 64 and 68. The Jews have been kicked out multiple times. Uh, and right now it's the Christians who are being held accountable. Nero's the emperor, he's a dictator. Rome had burned, the Christians were blamed. Peter was already likely martyred. Paul in prison and would follow. Israel was under attack and Jerusalem was threatened. So that's the period of time that this book is written. So, um, so under when uh, in the, the handout, the answer is the second column is 64 to 68 AD. And Rome had transitioned from the many to the one Caesar with at this point, disastrous results. So the circumstances were um, that there was nothing that Christians could rely on, Jewish Christians in particular. That's what's under the circumstances. So over on the right, Israel was under attack. Their ruler was not to be trusted. Christians were blamed for all that was wrong and Peter and Paul were being martyred. So, so here's, here's what I've summarized at this point. So Paul or his trainee wrote the book. They wrote it to Herodian, quote, i.e. Herodian or someone like Herodian. That's what I mean by the quotes. Herodian and his friends between 64 and 68 AD and the all supports were crumbling. What were the circumstances? All supports were crumbling and who could you trust? So 
Let's go now to the theme of the book of Hebrews. So I think I referenced this last week. What do people usually say that the theme of Hebrews is? Christ is better, right? Usually it's what people will say. Okay, so I'm going to quote Jeremy again. That is reductionism. <laughs> that's, not, that's not an accurate representation of the theme of the book of Hebrews because Jesus is not the subject of the book. He's the object of the book. So let's talk about what I mean by that. Um, at one time I had to, I, I was writing, uh, I wrote a book and I, I had several people proofread it. And Judy Logan, if you're out there <laughs> watching, Judy Logan was, um, one of the people that edited this book. So I have this, you know, 250 page manuscript that she read and I gave it to her in hard copy and she gave it back to me in hard copy and she had penciled her changes in red. So I started going through the pages looking for a page that did not have a red mark on it. <laughs> Every page of the book. She would write things like, where are you going with this? <laughs> This doesn't fit. Oh, cheesy character, something like that. But over and over, and, and she corrected my punctuation everywhere. But um, over and over again, she would say, this is passive voice. No passive voice. No passive voice. No passive voice. So, so what she, by passive voice, it's, it's to be verbs. Is, was, were those kinds of words. So she wanted me to say, uh, in, in, instead of using passive voice and descriptors, make the verb the descriptive part. Use verbs that have meaning. Okay, so let's go to, go to the end of this book again. Last chapter. Um, chapter 13, verse 22. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. So the author of this book calls this an exhortation. Okay, so first is, if somebody writes you an exhortation and you say, what is the exhortation? Would it be in passive voice? No, if you exhort your kids, you exhort your kids to do something. Clean up your room, you know, go take out the trash, do this, get your hair dressed, dress right. You know, they're all active verbs. Okay, so let's go look at some of them. Okay, the most common quoted theme for Hebrews is, uh, Jesus is better. And I talked about my picky editors. Thank you, Judy. Um, the author, author has his purpose in 1322. And that next passage there, Christ is the object. He's not the subject. So let's go look at, here's, if it's exhortation, what is he exhorting them to do? Let's just run through the book real quick and look at the exhortations. They're up there. Uh, so let's go to Hebrews Start at the beginning, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. So he first talks about how Christ is superior to uh, angels and to um, um, the prophets. In verse 2, 1, for this reason, since Christ is better, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Okay, let's go to, th so pay attention is the first one. Verse 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So they're supposed to consider. Okay, now let's go to um, verse 12 of that. Take care, brethren, that any of you, uh, that there should be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. So he's saying, don't fall away. Okay. 
So chapter 4, verse 1. You see what he's doing is he talks about something about Christ and then he makes an application. You need to pay attention. You need to not drift away. You need to not fall away. Chapter um, uh, 4, verse 1. You need to fear. Fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, you should seem to have come short of it. Chapter uh, 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Uh, verse 14, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast your confession. Uh, okay, let's go to chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance. Uh, verse 11 of that chapter, we desire that each of you show the same diligence as we re to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Uh, you getting the point so far? Let's go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, starting in 19, is the uh, God's garden section. You know, the let us, let us draw near, let us hold fast, let us consider all the different kinds of lettuce. Um, I'm just going to skip forward to verse 32. Remember the former days after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Uh, verse 35 and 36. Do not throw away your confidence, for you have need of endurance, so that you may receive what's promised. So you can see the point is, the point Whatever you say the subject of the book it is, it's something that he wants the readers to do. It's an exhortation for them to do. And basically it's all aligned around focusing on Christ, understanding who he is, and then taking action accordingly. Okay? And then, he, and then but it, it's just as many, not just as many, but there are many times where he'll say, do this and don't do that. The book is in contrast all over the place. So do this and don't do that. So the don't part, don't fall away, 6 for 6. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, 10.25. Don't sin willfully, 10.26. Don't shrink back, 10.38 and 39. So here's what I wrote the theme as. The theme is you focus to flourish, you shrink for shame. So he's saying you need to do this and not do that. Who are you focusing on? You're focusing on Christ. So Christ is object, he is better. And that's what you need to focus on. That needs to be the sole thing that you're concentrating on, okay? What am I doing for time? Um, So how he does this, um, I, I wanted to have a chess set that I could hold up pieces up here in comparison because, uh, but I couldn't find pieces that are any big. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a little, hand, a little uh, handle thing. I got some, some uh, things, uh, paint stirrers from, uh, from uh, Lowe's and I'm gonna put a picture on him, and it's this and not this. What he does in the book is he says, let's compare Jesus to the prophets. Let's compare Jesus to angels. Let's compare Jesus to Moses. Let's compare unbelief to belief. Let's compare Melchizedek and Aaron. Let's compare one sacrifice, many sacrifices. Let's compare the earthly kingdom an eternal kingdom. Okay, so that's the communication style of the book. So what I have down there next is application. Let me summarize at this point. So who wrote the book? Paul or one of his trainees, they wrote it to somebody like Herodian and his friends. 
probably 64 to 68 AD. And what are the circumstances? All supports were crumbling. Who or what could you trust? The theme is if you focus on Christ, you're going to flourish. If you shrink away, you're going to suffer shame. And he does the whole book as a series of contrasts. So I was thinking of this and uh, thinking of applications. <laughs> and I happened to open my, my little Drudge Report news thing this morning. And it was all the attack that just happened on Israel from Iran. <laughs> and I thought, what are we, 2,000 years later? The situation is just the same. Israel is under attack. Christians are blamed for all that's wrong in the society, right? We're responsible for the fact that uh, uh, we have uh, homophobia or that we, we uh, have a, uh, we're racist or we're, you know, uh, we believe in uh, um, <laughs> the fact that there are only two sexes in the world. You know, we're, we're responsible for all that is wrong in this time. You know, uh, do we have, <laughs> I think about the rule of law. Um, something as simple for me, I don't know if you guys know, as you come up Five Mile Road, you see the signs about the new apartment buildings that they're going to put up across the street from us. So that area was zoned for R1, single dwelling, single resident houses. And basically in a span of uh, um, just a couple of months between the, the Washington legislature uh, changed it so that in cities uh, they could open that up. R1 now becomes as many houses, as many dwellings as you can put on it. That property, which is two acres, is going to have 48 apartments in it. So, and it's you know, what happened to the rule of law, to the process, to the discussion? Well, no, we have a crisis, so we're gonna solve the crisis. And the crisis will be, we're gonna build more units, we're just gonna open it up. That kind of thing is happening on every, at every level within government. What happens is, it's the concept of, you know, never waste a good crisis. It's everything from, oh, you have a student loan? Oh, we want you to vote for us, so we're going we're gonna to do away with your student loan, you know. Um, all the things that, that were the standards, the, the posts by which things are, are not true anymore. So if, if I go back to this, um, the circumstances, Israel is under attack. The rulers aren't rulers that you can trust. The Christians are responsible for things. Um, and Peter and Paul, leaders, I appreciate Jeremy as a teacher, but most of the great teachers that I think of in my life are dead. You know, the, the Billy Grahams of the world, the, the great people who are um, champions of the faith. You know, most of the people, if, if I'm turning to somebody who I want to know their opinion on something, most of them are dead. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at this and saying, this is just like my time. You know, this, the person who is writing to these people in, in Rome, all the things they're going to, it's like, it's like who can you trust? And, and the tendency when you do that is to just shrink back and, and be uh, under the radar, right? You don't, you don't, you know, if I don't know who I can trust, I just, I'm guarded about what I do. And what, what happens is he's saying, he's saying in the book of Hebrews, you want to enter into God's rest. And that means active faith in Christ and who he is. You've got to understand who he is. You've got to actively enter it. And the th shocking thing to me, I've been reading this for a couple of weeks, is the alternative is shame. But it's not shame from the world's perspective it is shame from god so he's saying you know it's a wonderful verse the two edge you know the word of god is a two-edged sword piercing the bones and marrow you know what that passage is about it's about god judging christians what's the passage 10 25 4 12 let's go to it
Let us therefore be, I'm reading in verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest any of you fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, to be able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The thoughts and intentions of whose heart? Christian's hearts. So he's saying, be diligent to enter rest. You can't give it lip service because God, is going, God will use his word to judge you. If you give it lip service, if you try and fake out God, God's going to know. God's word is going to uh, judge you in that process. And so it's, you, it's not an option to just sit in your cubicle and wait out the storm. The only, because God's not gonna let you sit there. So it doesn't matter that you can't trust the government. It doesn't matter that your country's under siege. It doesn't matter of, you know, what's going on in the world with Israel. So you need to focus on Christ. You need to focus on growing. He talks about how they're dull of hearing and they need to step forward. If you don't step forward, God's gonna hold you accountable for that. And so that's his word of exhortation in the book. So it is, you're gonna focus and you'll flourish. But if you shrink, you're gonna be shamed by God. So, okay, I'm, I'm, that's the introduction. That's what we're gonna go about. So next week we're gonna go start into the contrast but I promised Cindy that I would at least talk about Melchizedek. So we'll get more when we get to the chapter, but sort of like, why is Melchizedek in here at all? So, um, so the background of the story is that, remember um, Abraham and Lot separated and he, he said, he, Abraham said, Lot, you can take this choice or this choice, either one you want. And Lot said, oh, this is a much better area, Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to go over there. And Abraham said, okay, I'm going to go over here. And then Lot got himself in trouble. And what happened is raiders came and took Lot and his family captives. And so Abraham raised up an army of people in his own house and came and saved Lot. And as he's coming back, they met this guy named Melchizedek, who had never, his Never listed anywhere else in the Bible. But it says he is both a king and a priest. Okay, so now Abraham, this is before most of all the, you know, Abrahamic covenant details are beginning to be all worked out. But what happens is Abraham, uh, what ha um, Melchizedek came, blessed Abraham and provided food for them, provided basically refreshments for his troops, okay? And Abraham gave him a, a tithe, a tenth of the spoils, okay? And Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And so um, this is used as an illustration of Christ. So the point in the book, um, so first of all, did priestly service precede Levi? You know, in the Levitical priesthood. Well, yes. If you go back to uh, Genesis 8.20, um, what happens is Noah comes off the boat and he offers sacrifices, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. He's doing a priestly service. If you look at Job, the first five verses of Job, it says Job uh, did sacrifices every day for his children. So he is acting as a, um, an intermediary. He's act doing a priestly function for his children because they might have sinned during that day. So. There's obviously the concept of priest predates Abraham. But once Abraham came along, it, within the lineage of Abraham, one, one part of his line, Judah, was going to be the king, right? One part of the line, Levi, was going to be the priest. So it's impossible for a Jew to be both priest and king, according to the lineage, right? So what the, the point of putting Melchizedek in the book the reason it's here is because Jesus is both 
a biblical king and priest. He's a king by his lineage through David, because that's part of the promises to David. And he's a priest, but he's a priest by some order that is beyond the Abrahamic line. And so it gives him a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, like Melchizedek. And part of the problem is, it sounds like Melchizedek was dropped in out of nowhere. It says, without genealogy, without father and mother, or all these kinds of things. Um, the point is that he didn't get his kingly and priestly status because of lineage of parents. He got it because it was uh, God... Um, set him there in that position. And it says Salem, he was the king of Salem. You know what Salem is? Jerusalem. It's the early name for Jerusalem. So he was the king of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, God, God had priests and kings in Jerusalem before Abraham ever set foot in the place. Okay? So um, that's his point. So when we get there, I'll go into more detail. But that's why he's there. Okay. Next week, we're going to go into chapter one and talk about how Christ is better. So I've, I've done a whole lot in two weeks, but kind of my point of this is if what you say, if, if you come to the book and you just say the theme of the book is Christ is better and I don't know who wrote it and I don't know who he wrote it to, then when you come to passages in the book, um, it's hard to relate to understanding what he's actually saying. So when he says, you need to focus on Christ, if it, if it really is 64 to 68 and he's writing to people who are in Rome, their world is crumbling around them. They could have somebody knock on their door at any day and say, hey, you're gonna come down and join Paul. You're gonna get beheaded. Or your house is gonna get burned down because you burned down the city. Um, they can't go back home because their countries under siege. So what can they do? They can look to Christ. And so he says, the whole book is about that. And I think that makes it much more real. So questions? Okay, next week we'll go do more. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Hebrews and for what we can learn from it. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us to take seriously uh, your charge to us to focus and to be in fellowship and to do the things that, we're, that we were created to do. And we pray, Father, for your guidance in doing that. In Jesus' name, amen.